Three questions to get us started. All right, question one. Why is it so weird that the movie Stuart Little was written by M. Night Shyamalan? Question two, why does Neil deGrasse Tyson keep making this tweet? And question three, how did Lil John make an entire career out of yelling, okay, what, yeah? The answer to all three of these questions happens to be the same. It's because of their brand. Michael Jordan, he can't have his own shoe. What are your views on product placements and necessity? This world is all about branding and marketing. Angelina Jolie's fashion brand. What delicious McDonald's. Brand building is real. The artist formerly known as is a media invention. What you're looking at is a room full of white middle-aged men all named Simon. S-I-M-O-N. Except for this guy, his name is spelled S-I-I-M-O-N. He legally had it changed, put in the extra I, so he would stand out. Now, if you are going through a stack of resumes, or if you're looking at names in your email inbox, or God forbid a dating app where the only people you can date are Simons, you're gonna look twice at the Cy Iman, aren't ya? That was the actual logic used by this guy, Simon Reynolds. I pronounced the extra I, because he has the audacity to include it. Back in the 80s, he was just a young guy trying to make it in the competitive world of advertising, and he wanted to make a name for himself by making a name for himself. Now, old Simon would go on to, you know, have a world-class advertising career, win a bunch of awards, make some iconic ads, even write a couple of books. But even back in the 80s, Simon knew that the rules of advertising didn't just have to stay in the world of selling soft drink. You could use these exact same principles to turn yourself from just some guy into an iconic brand. It's absolutely essential that you think about yourself as a brand from this moment forward. It used to be that the word brand was reserved only for, you know, McDonald's, Nike, and Campbell's Soup corporations. And before that, it was reserved just for cows and stuff. But now, we live in the era where it's people. Personal brands are a thing. We understand that Kim Kardashian the brand is an image that has been strategically crafted by Kim Kardashian the person. And it's not hard to say why. The money, or fame, or power, or status, or whatever your jam is, it's there. But it's not just mega celebrities, it's also everybody. Whether you realize it or not, you have a personal brand. If I looked you up on Google and didn't find anything about you on the first page of results, that's your personal brand. But of course, everything has a price. And for personal branding, that price is the commodification of absolutely everything. Because when your entire life can be monetized or turned into some way to tell the world you're cool, then everything you do becomes a business opportunity. And while this might sound awesome to yuppies or someone who's severely coked up, to me, this kind of sounds like a bit of a spiritually depraved nightmare. Oh dear, man. Are we doomed to all just become little walking brands? Who is there hope? All right, let's start at the start. Turning yourself into an icon is nothing new. Emperors, pharaohs, religious figures, military leaders, they've been doing this for centuries. Alexander the Great, for example, is often regarded as the world's first celebrity. But our focus is somewhere else. It's when this thing became accessible to anybody. Historically, what we're looking for is the first time that people born outside of the aristocracy started using the idea of themselves as a tool for personal gain. And yeah, man, it's the Renaissance. It's always the frickin' Renaissance, isn't it? So big Leo D, he made quite a few things, didn't he? Designed a helicopter, painted the Mona Lisa, had some little sketches for a machine gun. All very eye-catching, all very cool, but unfortunately we're talking about something that's neither. We're talking about this invention of his. Da Vinci invented the cover letter. That's what this is, that's what you're looking at right now. This, just like LinkedIn, I guess, <laughs> is a letter that he wrote in order to get work. To get work from somebody who would otherwise ignore him because he wasn't part of the aristocracy. Yes, he was talented, but they didn't know about it. So he decides, I'm gonna tell him. Now, there are some really interesting parts of this letter. For example, he hides the pacifist part of him and instead sort of puts on this pro-war value attitude, all to get the job. Yeah, Da Vinci was branding himself. Wild, right? And this makes sense. If there is a class divide between you and the people who you need to talk to to get money, even if you are talented, you've still got to bridge that gap. And Da Vinci did this by literally telling people he was special. Uh, it sounds so simple and reductive to us now, but I mean, when you think about it, his brand was so strong that it's literally now weaved into our history. Our next milestone comes from Oscar Wilde and the Dandies. The whole dandy movement was about intentionally crafting your public image. It was about saying, hey, I would like to be this, now I shall do it. Why it's important to this story is how explicit it is. There is documented strategy from that era of how you can go from just being some chump to being a witty, fancy, frivolous, slightly androgynous super you. A dandy, baby. But still, crafting your image is still very much a fringe practice. So our next up 
Dale Carnegie's landmark book hits the shelves. How to win friends and influence people. This is a key moment because it's the first time that personal branding has been talked about as something that anyone can apply to their own life. It's not like the dandies. He's not telling you to be part of some subculture. He's telling you to be yourself, just a more motivated, better version of yourself. And in doing so, he sort of ended up spawning the entire self-help genre. And we'll check back in with that genre in a minute. But right now, let's gossip about celebs. Throughout the 20th century, you've got movie stars, athletes, musicians. These people are popping up everywhere and the media machine is making sure the world knows them. But for our story, the story of how personal brands became the default, we need to focus on one particular moment in 1963. We need to look at this photo. Two actors. Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton. Who would later become a Hollywood power couple. But when this photo was taken, they were just Hollywood co-stars. And they were married to other people. Ooh. They're not posing for the photo. They don't even know the camera's there. That means you have a front row seat to a secret movie star love affair. This photo was so damn salacious that not only did it skyrocket the entire paparazzi industry, but as sociologist Ellis Cashmore puts it, it represents an inflection point in what celebrity even means. That is to say, yeah, they were making a movie, but more people wanted to watch the scandal. I can never be more far away from you than this. The private lives of famous stars were now just as, if not more, entertaining than whatever talent it was that made them famous in the first place. So what's our next moment in our journey to understand why personal brands are a thing? Welcome to 1972. This is a blink and you miss it type moment, but I'd argue that the impact is pretty freaking relevant. In 1972, cable television was deregulated in the United States. And this, in effect, kickstarts the avalanche that is media fragmentation. Instead of five channels, now you've got 55 channels. And oh my gosh, how do you reach everybody all at once? What we're seeing is the early versions of a world where attention is currency. And when this attention becomes scarce and scattered, the world learns that the solution lies in branding. This is perfect. And you can see this echoed in other parts of the 1970s. The Dress for Success movement parallels this, but on a personal level. Life is crowded and unstable, but if you present yourself fine, you'll be fine. Next up, the 90s. Choo -choo. Hey, while we're talking about brands, let me talk to you about my brand, as well as the company and the brand that I used to make that brand on. All right, there's too many brands. We're talking about Shopify. So if you make something, if you're creative or entrepreneurial, and the irony of this video isn't too thick for you, then Shopify might be the thing that you try next. All right, so what does it do? It's an e-commerce platform, and you can sell online, offline, on social media. It's a merchant for all seasons, really. I use it to sell my products. So on Struthless.com, you can see here, I got all this sort of stuff. And I know that for a lot of us doing the Alphabet Soup set of the moment, this might be of interest. So if you are thinking about starting a shop, if wherever your art takes you is a place where you'd like to monetize it, then check out Shopify. This is the truth. When I switched to Shopify, my sales got so much better and that's because they have all these resources and plugins and stuff. So like things that help people navigate around the website that I just didn't know about. They literally power millions of entrepreneurs in 175 countries. And it doesn't matter where you are on your journey. If you're just starting out, it's cool. If you're looking to scale up, it's cool. First sale to full scale. I believe is the tagline. So yeah, if you're left with the taste in your mouth that you're like, hey, this brand business is actually something I want in on, Shopify's your bet, baby. Got a nice little link in the description. Check it out. On the already famous end of the spectrum, personality and brand are overlapping more than ever before. Celebrities aren't content to just be a celebrity. Now they have to be an empire. They gotta sell shoes, cookbooks. But the phenomenon that I wanna focus on, it's not the Michael Jordan pillowcase. It's what's going on in the other end, the not famous end, the regular people who make up the majority. And in 1993, something happened that I think tells that story best. The company IBM laid off 60,000 workers. So IBM, if you don't know, they were around during the uh, sepia photo railroad days. And they changed with the times as these large companies tend to do, but they always had this one thing that stayed the same. They were a family company. This core belief and this proven track record that they would never ever lay anybody off. If you got a job at IBM, you had that job for life. You were safe. In fact, they even had a name for it. They called it the cradle to grave culture. So by the 90s, a lot of large companies had already buckled to the tides of globalization. But when IBM, the lifer company did it, it really symbolized the end of an era, the era of secure employment. So we're left with a generation of people worried about their future livelihoods. A lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of doubt, which of course creates a giant demand for the self-help industry. People needed hope. And guys like Tony Robbins gave it to them in the form of a philosophy. Embrace your personal power. Personal power. 
That, to me, is the single number one foundational key to all success. If you use it, you can get everything else that you want. In an unstable world, you are the stable thing. In fact, it's here in this 90s self-help era that we actually get that term, personal brand. But in any case, the 90s self-help movement offered a practical solution. Yeah, sure, work is unstable, so stop acting like an employee and start acting like an entrepreneur. And what do you know, the opportunity to stand out was standing right in front of them. Yep, the mystical, terrifying internet. This is where a really interesting shift happens, because if you're a person, but you're using a computer, how do you transfer this, your personality, into this? Because online, you're not seeing those tiny micro expressions, you're not getting a vibe from the visual. So if you do want to convey your personality, it sort of ends up heightened. And this set the tone for how people put themselves on the internet. Surf's up, see you on the net. Now it's one thing for this vibe to exist, but it's another thing for this vibe to have a framework on which to prosper. The one that really took off, the big global one, MySpace, it's no coincidence that it took off because it was already attached to a personal brand. When you got a MySpace account, you were already friends with Tom. Tom has become this guy. This tiny little decision was monumental for two reasons. Firstly, Tom showed you the blueprint for how to put your personality online. That is amazing. We all learn through examples and Tom was one. Secondly, because everyone knew who Tom was, he was famous, but he also wasn't. While Tom was ubiquitous, he was also just some guy. And in essence, all celebrities are just some guy, but the media machine does its best to hide this. Tom represented the fact that celebrity is a spectrum. You weren't famous or not famous. Now, you could be a little bit famous, halfway famous, like Tom. And for a generation of people living in economic instability, ooh, baby, does that look attractive. And if you're not on social media, don't worry, because this lesson's on TV too. Paris Hilton, Jackass, Big Brother, they're all having their time in the sun. And at the intersection of these two worlds, internet fame and reality TV, we have Teela Tequila. Teela Tequila was the person who had the most friends on MySpace. In the story of personal branding, I'd argue that she is the most culturally significant person of the 2000s. Unlike Paris Hilton, she wasn't born into fame. She worked her way up the spectrum of fame. And when she was there, she turned it into a reality TV show. She turned it into music. She turned it into products. She even created her own proto-only fans. She literally pioneered the online personal brand model. Make content, get attention, monetize, repeat. Teela Tequila walked so Gary Vee could run. Your personal brand is your resume. So so all of us could run. Thanks, Teela. Because that's the real story, isn't it? The generation of teenagers, my generation, watching this all happen on a computer screen. The only tool you need to replicate that success. And what's more, that computer, for a lot of teenagers, was also where they were practicing the very skill of crafting a personality. All of this is an inadvertent training ground for creating a personal brand. And then... The stock market is now down 21%. It was the worst day on Wall Street since the crash of 1987. And that means life, as most Americans know it, is about to change, in some cases dramatically. That's the perfect storm, isn't it? 2008, global financial crisis, no jobs available anywhere. Oh, that's all right. I've seen Teela Tequila make a bunch of money. There's a lot of brilliant creativity from this time. The blogs, the blogs, the blogs everywhere. Then you've got the micro blogs, you've got Twitter, and of course, Instagram. You might not have a job, but you can build an empire and you can do it all with the Kelvin filter. With zero media backing, you had people like Tyler the Creator popping up. You had Tim Ferriss' blog turning into books. And should you not want to build an empire, if you don't want fame, don't worry. You can use the exact same tools to just look pretty cool. We all want to look cool, right? Only you have to translate what you means into images. What photos are you? And essentially, this mechanic is you branding yourself. That's your personal brand. Because sure, you might not want to be an influencer, but you're still quite conscious of how you appear online. And this muscle to package and brand yourself, it's getting strengthened by things like BuzzFeed quizzes, like which Disney princess are you? Are you a wizard person or a lizard person? Take the test. And while we're on the topic of clickbait and listicles, there's one little trend that I'd like to examine, and that is the use of the word Instagrammable. 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 Instagrammability. Instagrammable art. The most Instagrammable food. Most Instagrammable spots. And look, I get it. The word Instagrammable on the surface, it does just look like jargon. But it also, when you look at it long enough, it tells the entire story about what personal branding is and what it became and why it is so ubiquitous. We're not picking a vacation destination and taking a picture once we get there. We're thinking, <laughs> can I get a great picture? If I can't, I'm not going to go. 
For a location to be Instagrammable, its value lies not in going to the location, but in capturing content of you going to the location to later post online to build your brand. It was around here that the smart people started throwing around the term identity capital. But yeah, the whole idea was build your identity capital and the units of capital that you have are content that will in turn build your personal brand, which you can then hopefully translate into money. Not everybody wants that, but everybody can have that. And that's a really, really fascinating distinction. The strongest part of the whole personal branding narrative is the accessibility. And while most people have built the muscle to brand themselves by this point, there was one other force that made a lot of people think twice. Canceling. Yeah, and not the celebrity type of deplatforming. I'm talking about the canceling of ordinary people. This was a weird mid 2010s thing that just seemed to happen every other week. It was weird, dude. And not ordinary people who did obscene stuff. Ordinary people who did benign stuff, but for whatever reason, somebody took this mistake and thought it was the worst thing in the world. And then all of a sudden you get this regular person who's never had a scrap of internet attention suddenly become the internet's punching bag. So these incidents, they're so isolated, but of course the negativity bias kicks in. So this is our data set and we're like, oh my gosh, I'm on the internet. Oh, this could happen to me. What am I not aware of? How am I problematic? Am I gonna post something and suddenly incite the hate of everybody? That was now a possibility. And because it's a possibility, it needs a little solution. So this is the final piece in our puzzle because this created a culture of disclosure. Put yourself up, but maybe not all of it. You know what I mean? Just in case. You could call this manners or common courtesy, or you could call it censorship and people having to be on constant damage control. The conscious adaptation of you into an image that you've calculated to suit a context. This is how we all became a brand. So what do you do? I like the availability of the game, but I don't like the implications of it. But the thing that I can't reconcile with is the fact that this was born out of economic instability that caused alienation and then the default answer is to commodify yourself which further alienates you. What do you do man? I mean do you go like RuPaul and just double down and play the game better than anybody? Or do you go like Hillary Duff and just say see ya? I don't personally have an answer but I did hear one. Alright let me ask you this because I don't want to live in the old medieval world in which our station in life was predetermined by other mammals. And I also don't want to live in the present world where the obsession with status and authenticity reduces us to shallow, neurotic creatures. So where's the happy medium here? That's a super easy question. You have 30 seconds to answer it. Go. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, everyone should touch more grass and get to know their neighbors. And I always say that the best antidote to self-making is genuine relationships with people who basically can see through our bullshit make it a lot harder to maintain facades. And I think that's all the easier if more of us had the kind of a degree of economic security could at least ameliorate the desperation to get ahead in the gig economy. And you know how after you listen to a podcast, the day after, it's all gone, but you still sort of remember the ideas. The one soundbite that actually stuck with me from the answer, it wasn't the academic stuff, it was the meme. Everyone should touch more grass. I know it's not even a fresh meme, but it's also kind of the truth, right? Connect less with the idea of yourself and more with the world. Maybe this time, it is just that simple. Thank you very much for watching. One final note, why did I pick brands? Because brands starts with B. Yep, this is episode two of my 26 documentaries, each starting with a different letter. If you wanna do something similar, I made a framework, so check out the Alphabet Superset link. Also, Shopify link, once again, thank you. Have fun commodifying your existence and touching grass. Have a beautiful day. Catch ya.